Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 220, Thomas Reed on First Principles and Common Sense, Part 2. In the previous episode of the Trinity's podcast, you heard some of Thomas Reed's general thoughts about first principles or principles of common sense. These are supposed to be things that any normal adult human can know, and any normal adult human will know them unless they give in to speculative theories that are inconsistent with them, in which case they won't believe them and they won't know them, or unless they're corrupted by education or prejudice or some kind of irrational feeling. These are things which everyone in principle can know and which everyone really should know. And Reed thinks these are the proper starting points for arguments in pretty much any field of human knowledge. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, you'll hear from some further chapters in his book, Essays on the Intellectual Powers of Man. And in these chapters, Reed actually lists what he thinks are some important first principles. He doesn't argue that these are all of the first principles, but he thinks they are important examples. And if you've read a lot of Thomas Reed, like I have, you realize that every one of these is something he thought of in reaction to the work of one of his fellow philosophers, people like Leibniz, Spinoza, Hume, and Berkeley. As you listen, you can ask yourself, are these things that I know, and are these things that anyone should know? If so, then maybe Reed's right. These really are first principles. They really are things which are self-evident and which we don't have to argue for, although in some cases we can. Here then, Thomas Reed on first principles. Essays on the Intellectual Powers of Man, Essay 6, Chapter 5, The First Principles of Contingent Truths. Surely, says Bishop George Barclay, it is a work well deserving our pains to make a strict inquiry concerning the first principles of knowledge, to sift and examine them on all sides. What was said in the last chapter is intended both to show the importance of this inquiry and to make it more easy. But in order that such an inquiry may be actually made, it is necessary that the first principles of knowledge be distinguished from other truths and presented to view that they may be sifted and examined on all sides. In order to this end, I shall attempt a detail of those I take to be such, and of the reasons why I think them entitled to that classification. If the enumeration should appear to some redundant, to others deficient, and to others both, if things which I conceive to be first principles should to others appear to be vulgar errors, or to be truths which derive their evidence from other truths, and therefore not first principles, in these things every man must judge for himself. I shall rejoice to see an enumeration more perfect in any or all of those respects, being persuaded that the agreement of men of judgment and candor in first principles would be of no less consequence to the advancement of knowledge in general than the agreement of mathematicians in the axioms of geometry has been to the advancement of that science." The truths that fall within the compass of human knowledge, whether they be self-evident or deduced from those that are self-evident, may be reduced to two classes. They are either necessary and immutable truths, whose contrary is impossible, or they are contingent and mutable, depending upon some effect of will and power which had a beginning and may have an end. That a cone is the third part of a cylinder of the same base and the same altitude is a necessary truth. It depends not upon the will and power of any being. It is immutably true and the contrary impossible. That the sun is the center around which the earth and the other planets of our system perform their revolution is a truth, but it is not a necessary truth. It depends upon the power and will of that being who made the sun and all the planets and who gave them those motions that seemed best to him. If all truths were necessary truths, 
there would be no occasion for different tenses in the verbs by which they are expressed. What is true in the present time would be true in the past and future, and there would be no change or variation of anything in nature. We use the present tense in expressing necessary truths, but it is only because there is no flexion of the verb which includes all times. When I say that three is the half of six, I use the present tense, but I mean to express not only what now is, but what always was and always will be. And so every proposition is to be understood by which we mean to express a necessary truth. Contingent truths are of another nature. As they are changeable, they may be true at one time and not at another, and therefore the expression of them must include some point or period of time. The distinction commonly made between abstract truths and those that express matters of fact or real existences coincides in a great measure but not altogether with that between necessary and contingent truths. The necessary truths that fall within our knowledge are, for the most part, abstract truths. We must accept the existence and nature of the Supreme Being, which is necessary. Other existences are the effects of will and power. They had a beginning and are mutable. Their nature is such as the Supreme Being was pleased to give them. Their attributes and relations must depend upon the nature God has given them, the powers with which he has endowed them, and the situation in which he has placed them. The conclusions deduced by reasoning from first principles will commonly be necessary or contingent according as the principles are from which they are drawn. On the one hand, I take it to be certain that whatever can, by just reasoning, be inferred from a principle that is necessary must be a necessary truth, and that no contingent truth can be inferred from principles that are necessary. Thus, as the axioms in mathematics are all necessary truths, so are all the conclusions drawn from them, that is, the whole body of that science. But from no mathematical truth can we deduce the existence of anything, not even of the objects of the science. On the other hand, I apprehend there are very few cases in which we can, from principles that are contingent, deduce truths that are necessary. I can only recollect one instance of this kind, namely that from the existence of things contingent and mutable, we can infer the existence of an immutable and eternal cause of them. As the minds of men are occupied much more about the truths that are contingent than about those that are necessary, I shall first endeavor to point out the principles of the former kind. First, then, I hold as a first principle the existence of everything of which I am conscious. Consciousness is an operation of the understanding of its own kind and cannot be logically defined. The objects of consciousness are our present pains, our pleasures, our hopes, our fears, our desires, our doubts, our thoughts of every kind. In a word, all the passions and all the actions and operations of our minds while they are present. We may remember them when they are past, but we are conscious of them only while they are present. When a man is conscious of pain, he is certain of its existence. When he is conscious that he doubts or believes, he is certain of the existence of those operations. But the irresistible conviction he has of the reality of those operations is not the effect of reasoning. It is immediate and intuitive. The existence, therefore, of those passions and operations of our minds, of which we are conscious, is a first principle which nature requires us to believe upon her authority. If I am asked to prove that I cannot be deceived by consciousness, to prove that it is not a fallacious sense, I can find no proof. I cannot find any antecedent truth from which it is deduced, or upon which its evidence depends. It seems to disdain any such derived authority and to claim my assent in its own right. If any man could be found so frantic as to deny that he thinks, while he is conscious of it, I may wonder, I may laugh, or I may pity him, but I cannot reason the matter with him. We have no common principles from which we may reason, therefore we can never join issue in an argument. This, I think, is the only principle of common sense that has never directly been called in question. It seems to be so firmly rooted in the minds of men as to retain its authority with the greatest skeptics. 
David Hume, after annihilating body and mind, time and space, action and causation, and even his own mind, acknowledges the reality of the thoughts, sensations, and passions of which he is conscious. As, therefore, the real existence of our thoughts and of all the operations and feelings of our own minds is believed by all men, as we find ourselves incapable of doubting it, and as incapable of offering any proof of it, it may be justly considered as a first principle or dictate of common sense. Another first principle, I think, is that the thoughts of which I am conscious are the thoughts of a being which I call myself, my mind, my person. The thoughts and feelings of which we are conscious are continually changing, and the thought of this moment is not the thought of the last moment, but something which I call myself remains under this change of thought. This self has the same relation to all the successive thoughts I am conscious of. They are all my thoughts, and every thought which is not my thought must be the thought of some other person. If any man asks for proof of this, I confess I can give none. There is an evidence in the proposition itself which I am unable to resist. Shall I think that thought can stand by itself without a thinking being, or that ideas can feel pleasure and pain? My nature dictates to me that it is impossible." and that nature has dictated the same to all men, appears from the structure of all languages. For in all languages men have expressed thinking, reasoning, willing, loving, hating, by personal verbs, which, from their nature, require a person who thinks, reasons, wills, loves, or hates. From which it appears that men have been taught by nature to believe that thought requires a thinker, reason a reasoner, and love a lover. Another first principle I take to be that those things did really happen which I distinctly remember. This has one of the surest marks of a first principle, for no man ever pretended to prove it, and yet no man in his wits calls it into question. The testimony of memory, like that of consciousness, is immediate. It claims our assent upon its own authority. Suppose that a learned counsel, in defense of a client against the concurring testimony of witnesses of credit, should insist upon a new topic to invalidate the testimony. Admitting, says he, the integrity of the witnesses, and that they distinctly remember what they have given in evidence, it does not follow that the prisoner is guilty. It has never been proved that the most distinct memory may not be fallacious." Show me any necessary connection between that act of the mind which we call memory and the past existence of the event remembered. No man has ever offered a shadow of argument to prove such a conclusion, yet this is one link of the chain of proof against the prisoner, and, if it have no strength, the whole proof falls to the ground. Until this, therefore, be made evident, until it can be proved that we may safely rest upon the testimony of memory for the truth of past events, no judge or jury can justly take away the life of a citizen upon so doubtful a point. I believe we may take it for granted that this argument from a learned counsel would have no other effect upon the judge or jury than to convince them that he was disordered in his judgment. Counsel is allowed to plead everything for a client that is fit to persuade or to move Yet I believe no counsel ever had the boldness to plead this topic. And for what reason? For no other reason, surely, but because it is absurd. Now, what is absurd at the bar is so in the philosopher's chair. What would be ridiculous if delivered to a jury of honest, sensible citizens is no less so when delivered gravely in a philosophical dissertation. A past event may be known by reasoning, but that is not remembering it. When I remember a thing distinctly, I disdain equally to hear reasons for it or against it, and so I think does every man in his senses. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Reed gives a first principle that has to do with yourself.
Another first principle is, our own personal identity and continued existence as far back as we remember anything distinctly. This we know immediately and not by reasoning. It seems indeed to be a part of the testimony of memory. Everything we remember has such a relation to ourselves as to imply necessarily our existence at the time remembered. And there cannot be a more palpable absurdity than that a man should remember what happened before he existed. He must therefore have existed as far back as he remembers anything distinctly if his memory be not fallacious. This principle, therefore, is so connected with the last mentioned that it may be doubtful whether both ought not to be included in one. Let every one judge of this as he sees reason. Another first principle is that those things do really exist which we distinctly perceive by our senses and are what we perceive them to be. It is too evident to need proof that all men are by nature led to give implicit faith to the direct testimony of their senses long before they are capable of any bias from prejudices of education or of philosophy. How came we at first to know that there are certain things around us whom we call father and mother and sisters and brothers and nurse? Was it not by the testimony of our senses? How did these persons convey to us any information or instruction? Was it not by means of our senses? It is evident that we can have no communication, no correspondence or society with any created being, but by means of our senses. And until we rely upon their testimony, we must consider ourselves as being alone in the universe, without any fellow creature, living or inanimate, and to be left to converse with our own thoughts. All the arguments urged by George Barclay and by David Hume against the existence of a material world are grounded upon this principle that we do not perceive external objects themselves, but certain images or ideas in our own minds. But this is no dictate of common sense, but directly contrary to the sense of all who have not been taught it by philosophy. Another first principle, I think, is that we have some degree of power over our actions and the determinations of our will. All power must be derived from the fountain of power and of every good gift. Upon his good pleasure its continuance depends, and it is always subject to his control. Beings to whom God has given any degree of power and understanding to direct them to the proper use of it must be accountable to their Maker. But those who are entrusted with no power can have no account to make, for all good conduct consists in the right use of power, all bad conduct in the abuse of it. To call to account a being who never was entrusted with any degree of power is an absurdity no less than it would be to call to account an inanimate being. We are sure, therefore, if we have any account to make to the author of our being, that we must have some degree of power which as far as it is properly used entitles us to his approval, and when abused renders us obnoxious to his displeasure. It is not easy to say in what way we first get the notion or idea of power. It is neither an object of sense nor of consciousness. We see events, one succeeding another, but we see not the power by which they are produced. We are conscious of the operations of our minds, but power is not an operation of mind. If we had no notions but such as are furnished by the external senses and by consciousness, it seems to be impossible that we should ever have any conception of power. Accordingly, David Hume, who has reasoned the most accurately upon this hypothesis, denies that we have any idea of power and clearly refutes the account given by John Locke of the origin of this idea. But it is in vain to reason from a hypothesis against a fact, the truth of which every man may see by attending to his own thoughts. It is evident that all men, very early in life, not only have an idea of power, but a conviction that they have some degree of it in themselves. For this conviction is necessarily implied in many operations of mind, which are familiar to every man, and without which no man can act the part of a reasonable being. First, it is implied in every act of volition. 
Volition, it is plain, says John Locke, is an act of the mind, knowingly exerting that dominion which it takes itself to have over any part of the man by employing it in or withholding it from any particular action. Every volition, therefore, implies a conviction of power to do the action willed. A man may desire to make a visit to the moon or to the planet Jupiter, but nothing but insanity could make him will to do so. And if even insanity produced this effect, it must be by making him think it to be in his power. Secondly, this conviction is implied in all deliberation, for no man in his wits deliberates whether he shall do what he believes not to be in his power. Thirdly, the same conviction is implied in every resolution or purpose formed in consequence of deliberation. A man may as well form a resolution to pull the moon out of her sphere as to do the most insignificant action which he believes not to be in his power. The same thing may be said of every promise or contract wherein a man plights his faith, for he is not an honest man who promises what he does not believe he has power to perform. As these operations imply a belief of some degree of power in ourselves, so there are others equally common and familiar which imply a like belief with regard to others. When we impute to a man any action or omission as a ground of approval or of blame, we must believe he had power to do otherwise. The same is implied in all advice, exhortation, command, and rebuke, and in every case in which we rely upon his fidelity in performing any engagement or executing any trust. It is not more evident that mankind have a conviction of the existence of a material world than that they have the conviction of some degree of power in themselves and in others. Everyone over his own actions and the determinations of his will, a conviction so early, so general, and so interwoven with the whole of human conduct that it must be the natural effect of our constitution and intended by the author of our being to guide our actions. It resembles our conviction of the existence of a material world in this respect also, that even those who reject it in speculation find themselves under a necessity of being governed by it in their practice, and thus it will always happen when philosophy contradicts first principles. Another first principle is that the natural faculties by which we distinguish truth from error are not fallacious. If any man should demand a proof of this, it is impossible to satisfy him, for, suppose it should be mathematically demonstrated, this would signify nothing in this case, because to judge of a demonstration, a man must trust his faculties and take for granted the very thing in question. If a man's honesty were called into question, it would be ridiculous to refer it to the man's own word, whether he be honest or not. The same absurdity there is in attempting to prove, by any kind of reasoning, probable or demonstrative, that our reason is not fallacious, since the very point in question is whether reasoning may be trusted. If a skeptic should build his skepticism upon this foundation, that all our reasoning and judging powers are fallacious in their nature, or should resolve at least to withhold assent until it be proved that they are not, it would be impossible by argument to beat him out of this stronghold, and he must even be left to enjoy his skepticism. René Descartes certainly made a false step in this matter, for having suggested this doubt among others, that whatever evidence he might have from his consciousness, his senses, his memory, or his reason, yet possibly some malignant being had given him those faculties on purpose to impose upon him, and therefore that they are not to be trusted without a proper voucher. To remove this doubt, he endeavors to prove the being of a deity who is no deceiver, from which he concludes that the faculties he had given him are true and worthy to be trusted. It is strange that so acute a reasoner did not perceive that in this reasoning there is evidently a begging of the question. For if our faculties be fallacious, why may they not deceive us in this reasoning as well as in others? And if they are not to be trusted in this instance without a voucher, why not in others? Every kind of reasoning for the veracity of our faculties amounts to no more than taking their own testimony for the veracity. And this we must do implicitly until God gives us new faculties to sit in judgment upon the old faculties. And the reason why Descartes satisfied himself with so weak an argument for the truth of his faculties most probably was 
but he never seriously doubted of it. If any truth can be said to be prior to all others in the order of nature, this seems to have the best claim, because in every instance of assent, whether upon intuitive, demonstrative, or probable evidence, the truth of our faculties is taken for granted, and is, as it were, one of the premises on which our assent is grounded. How then come we to be assured of this fundamental truth on which all others rest? Perhaps evidence, as in many other respects it resembles light, so in this also, that as light, which is the discoverer of all visible objects, discovers itself at the same time, so evidence, which is the voucher for all truth, vouches for itself at the same time. This, however, is certain, that such is the constitution of the human mind, that evidence discerned by us forces a corresponding degree of assent, and a man who perfectly understood a just syllogism without believing that the conclusion follows from the premises would be more deformed than a man born without hands or feet. We are born under a necessity of trusting to our reasoning and judging powers, and a real belief of their being fallacious cannot be maintained for any considerable time by the greatest skeptic because it is doing violence to our constitution. It is like a man's walking upon his hands, a feat which some men upon occasion can exhibit, but no man ever made a long journey in this manner. Cease to admire his dexterity, and he will, like other men, betake himself to his legs. We may take notice of a property of the principle under consideration that seems to be common to it with many other first principles, and which can hardly be found in any principle that is built solely upon reasoning, and that is, that in most men it produces its effect without ever being attended to or made an object of thought. No man ever thinks of this principle unless when he considers the grounds of skepticism, yet it invariably governs his opinions. When a man in the common course of life gives credit to the testimony of his senses, his memory, or his reason, he does not put the question to himself whether these faculties may deceive him, Yet the trust he reposes in them supposes an inward conviction that in that instance, at least, they do not deceive him. It is another property of this and of many first principles that they force assent in particular instances more powerfully than when they are turned into a general proposition. Many skeptics have denied every general principle of science, excepting, perhaps, the existence of our present thoughts, Yet these men reason, and refute, and prove, they assent and dissent in particular cases, they use reasoning to overturn all reasoning, and judge that they ought to have no judgment, and see clearly that they are blind. Many have in general maintained that the senses are fallacious, yet there never was found a man so skeptical as not to trust his senses in particular instances when his safety required it. And it may be observed of those who have professed skepticism that their skepticism lies in generals, while in particulars they are no less dogmatical than others. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Reed gives a first principle which is relevant to what later philosophers have called the problem of other minds. Another first principle relating to existence is that there is life and intelligence in our fellow men with whom we converse. As soon as children are capable of asking a question or of answering a question, as soon as they show the signs of love, of resentment, or of any other affection, they must be convinced that those with whom they have this interaction are intelligent beings. It is evident that they are capable of such interaction long before they can reason. 
Everyone knows that there is a social interaction between the nurse and the child before it is a year old. It can, at that age, understand many things that are said to it. It can, by signs, ask and refuse, threaten and supplicate. It clings to its nurse in danger, enters into her grief and joy, is happy in her soothing and caresses, and unhappy in her displeasure. That these things cannot be without a conviction in the child that the nurse is an intelligent being, I think must be granted. Now I would ask how a child of a year old comes by this conviction. Not by reasoning, surely, for children do not reason at that age. Nor is it by external senses, for life and intelligence are not objects of the external senses. By what means or upon what occasions nature first gives this information to the infant mind is not easy to determine. We are not capable of reflecting upon our own thoughts at that period of life, and before we attain this capacity we have quite forgot how or on what occasion we first had this belief. We perceive it in those who are born blind and in others who are born deaf, and therefore nature has not connected it solely either with any object of sight or with any object of hearing. When we grow up to the years of reason and reflection, this belief remains. No man thinks of asking himself what reason he has to believe that his neighbor is a living creature. He would not be a little surprised if another person should ask him so absurd a question, and perhaps could not give any reason which would not equally prove a watch or a puppet to be a living creature. But, though you should satisfy him of the weakness of the reasons he gives for his belief, you cannot make him in the least doubtful. This belief stands upon another foundation than that of reasoning. Therefore, whether a man can give good reasons for it or not, it is not in his power to shake it off. Setting aside this natural conviction, I believe the best reason we can give to prove that other men are living and intelligent is that their words and actions indicate like powers of understanding as we are conscious of in ourselves. The very same argument applied to the works of nature leads us to conclude that there is an intelligent author of nature and appears equally strong and obvious in the last case as in the first so that it may be doubtful whether men, by the mere exercise of reasoning, might not as soon discover the existence of a deity as that other men have life and intelligence. The knowledge of the last is absolutely necessary to our receiving any improvement by means of instruction and example, and without these means of improvement there is no ground to think that we should ever be able to acquire the use of our reasoning powers. This knowledge, therefore, must be antecedent to reasoning, and therefore must be a first principle. It cannot be said that the judgments we form concerning life and intelligence in other beings are at first free from error, but the errors of children in this matter lie on the safe side. They are prone to attribute intelligence to things inanimate. These errors are of small consequence and are gradually corrected by experience and ripe judgment. But the belief of life and intelligence in other men is absolutely necessary for us before we are capable of reasoning, and therefore the author of our being has given us this belief antecedently to all reasoning. Another first principle I take to be that certain features of the countenance, sounds of the voice, and gestures of the body indicate certain thoughts and dispositions of mind that many operations of the mind have their natural signs in the countenance voice and gesture, I suppose every man will admit. The only question is whether we understand the signification of those signs by the constitution of our nature, by a kind of natural perception, similar to the perceptions of sense, or whether we gradually learn the significance of such signs from experience as we learn that smoke is a sign of fire, or that the freezing of water is a sign of cold. I take the first to be the truth. It seems to me incredible that the notions men have of the expression of features, voice, and gesture are entirely the fruit of experience. Children, almost as soon as born, may be scared and thrown into fits by a threatening or angry tone of voice. I knew a man who could make an infant cry by whistling a melancholy tune in the same or in the next room, and again by altering his key and the strain of his music could make the child leap and dance for joy. It is not by experience, surely, that we learn the expression of music, for its operation is commonly strongest the first time we hear it. 
One air expresses mirth and festivity, so that when we hear it, it is with difficulty we can forbear to dance. Another is sorrowful and solemn. One inspires with tenderness and love, another with rage and fury. It is not necessary that a man have studied either music or the passions in order to his feeling these effects. The most ignorant and unimproved, to whom nature has given a good ear, feels them as strongly as the most knowing. The countenance and gesture have an expression no less strong than the voice. The first time one sees a stern and fierce look, a contracted brow, and a menacing posture, he concludes that the person is inflamed with anger. We know that an angry countenance will fright a child in the cradle. Who has not observed that children very early are able to distinguish what is said to them in jest from what is said in earnest by the tone of your voice and the features of the face? They judge by these natural signs even when they seem to contradict the artificial signs. When I grasp an ivory ball in my hand, I feel a certain sensation of touch. In the sensation there is nothing external, nothing corporeal. The sensation is neither round nor hard. It is an act of feeling of the mind, from which I cannot by reasoning infer the existence of any material object, but by the constitution of my nature the sensation carries along with it the conception and belief of a round, hard body really existing in my hand. In like manner, when I see the features of an expressive face, I see only figure and color variously modified. But by the constitution of my nature, the visible object brings along with it the conception and belief of a certain passion or sentiment in the mind of the person. In the former case, a sensation of touch is the sign, and the hardness and roundness of the body I grasp is signified by that sensation. In the latter case, the features of the person is the sign, and the passion or sentiment is signified by it. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Reed discusses a first principle that involves our believing what we're told. Another first principle appears to me to be that there is a certain regard due to human testimony in matters of fact and even to human authority in matters of opinion. Before we are capable of reasoning about testimony or authority, there are many things which it concerns us to know for which we can have no other evidence. The wise author of nature has planted in the human mind a propensity to rely upon this evidence before we can give a reason for doing so. This, indeed, puts our judgment almost entirely in the power of those who are around us in the first period of life, but this is necessary both to our preservation and to our improvement. If children were so framed as to pay no regard to testimony or to authority, they must, in the literal sense, perish for lack of knowledge. It is not more necessary that they should be fed before they can feed themselves than that they should be instructed in many things before they can discover them by their own judgment. But, when our faculties ripen, we find reason to check that propensity to yield to testimony and to authority, which was so necessary and so natural in the first period of life. We learn to reason about the regard due to them, and see it to be a childish weakness to lay more stress upon them than reason justifies. Yet, I believe, to the end of life, most men are more apt to go into this extreme than into the contrary, and the natural propensity still retains some force. The natural principles by which our judgments and opinions are regulated before we come to the use of reason seem to be no less necessary to such a being as man than those natural instincts which the author of nature has given us to regulate our actions during that period. Another first principle is that there are many events depending upon the will of man in which there is a self-evident probability greater or less according to circumstances. There may be in some individuals such a degree of frenzy and madness that no man can say what they may or may not do, 
Such persons we find it necessary to put under restraint, that as far as possible they may be kept from doing harm to themselves or to others. They are not considered as reasonable creatures or members of society, but as men who have a sound mind, we depend upon a certain degree of regularity in their conduct, and could put a thousand different cases wherein we could venture ten to one that they will act in such a way, and not in the contrary. If we had no confidence in our fellow men that they will act such a part in such circumstances, it would be impossible to live in society with them. For that which makes men capable of living in society and uniting in a political body under government is that their actions will always be regulated in a great measure by the common principles of human nature. It may always be expected that they will regard their own interest and reputation and that of their families and friends, that they will repel injuries and have some sense of good offices, and that they will have some regard to truth and justice so far at least as not to swerve from them without temptation. It is upon such principles as these that all political reasoning is grounded. Such reasoning is never demonstrative, but it may have a very great degree of probability, especially when applied to great bodies of men. The last principle of contingent truths I mention is that in the phenomena of nature, what is to be will probably be like to what has been in similar circumstances. We must have this conviction as soon as we are capable of learning anything from experience, for all experience is grounded upon a belief that the future will be like the past. Take away this principle, and the experience of a hundred years makes us no wiser with regard to what is to come. This is one of those principles which, when we grow up and observe the course of nature, we can confirm by reasoning. We perceive that nature is governed by fixed laws, and that, if it were not so, there could be no such thing as prudence in human conduct. There would be no fitness in any means to promote an end, and what on one occasion promoted it might, as probably on another occasion, obstruct it. But the principle is necessary for us before we are able to discover it by reasoning, and therefore is made a part of our constitution and produces its effects before the use of reason. I do not affirm that those I have mentioned are all the first principles from which we may reason concerning contingent truths. Such enumerations, even when made after much reflection, are seldom perfect. Chapter 6, in Essay 6 of the Essays on the Intellectual Powers of Man, is called First Principles of Necessary Truths, and for sake of time I will just read the first principles themselves and not read's sometimes lengthy commentary on them. 1. There are some first principles that may be called grammatical, such as that every adjective in a sentence must belong to some substantive expressed or understood, that every complete sentence must have a verb. 2. There are logical axioms, such as that any construction of words which does not make a proposition is neither true nor false, that every proposition is either true or false, that no proposition can be both true and false at the same time, that reasoning in a circle proves nothing, that whatever may be truly affirmed of a genus may be truly affirmed of all the species and all the individuals belonging to that genus. 3. Everyone knows there are mathematical axioms. 4. I think there are axioms even in matters of taste. I never heard of any man who thought it a beauty in a human face to lack a nose or an eye or to have the mouth on one side. The fundamental rules of poetry and music and painting and dramatic action and eloquence have been always the same and will be so to the end of the world. 5. There are also first principles in morals that an unjust action has more demerit than an ungenerous one, that a generous action has more merit than a merely just one, that no man ought to be blamed for what it was not in his power to hinder, that we ought not to do to others what we would think unjust or unfair to be done to us in like circumstances. 6. The last class of first principles I shall mention we may call metaphysical. I shall particularly consider three of these because they have been called into question by David Hume. The first is, the qualities which we perceive by our senses must have a subject which we call body, and that the thoughts we are conscious of must have a subject which we call mind. The second metaphysical principle I mention is, that whatever begins to exist must have a cause which produced it. 
the third and last metaphysical principle I mention, which is opposed by the same author, is that design and intelligence in the cause may be inferred with certainty from marks or signs of it in the effect. This week's thinking music has been the track Lily So Far Away by Fireproof Babies. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can download or listen to that entire track. Next week, a little bit more from Thomas Reed as he discusses several factors that can prevent us from knowing what we should. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.